Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. By my count, this is episode number 750. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, at the new place. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching the video, I have a very sparsely decorated office office. The uh, studio is in construction, under construction, and all that sort of thing. So as you've been following this saga for the last couple of weeks, uh, no doubt you can see uh, small improvements, we hope, week to week. And uh, stay tuned for some news on that front down the line. I have with me today, I'm very excited uh, to have back for what I believe is the eighth time I did some research before this. Uh, we have Brandon Crow, who is a professor of New Testament at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And uh, most late, well, as the author of The Last Adam and The Hope of Israel, but most lately, uh, the new book here, Why Did Jesus Live a Perfect Life? Welcome, Brandon. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Camden. It's great to be back with you. So you got a, your, a master's shirt on. So that's not, that's the, we're talking golf here, not the seminary. That's right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Different masters, I guess, from 1929 <laughs> to uh, what was the first year of the master tournament? Somewhere in 35 or so. I don't remember, but I don't know like either. That. But you got then you got the master seminary. Yeah, who knows when? I don't know when that was. Oh, that's, that's another. Yeah, that's another very another different exegetical here. tradition. <laughs> Although they would, no doubt there would be very appreciative of the themes in this book uh, that we're going to be talking about today, but. I know you've been on the program a bunch, and I'm always I'm always excited to talk to you. I'm thankful for these opportunities, but I guess they just start to add up. I, I looked at the list. I was like, "How many times has Brandon been on?" So starting in 2012, <laughs> then I pulled up all the all the records, and I think yeah, this is the eighth. But it's wonderful to see the progression. I'm gonna you know jump ahead. I've already got a question in my questions lined up for this, but I'll just ask it right now because. Uh, maybe this wasn't planned, maybe it was, but starting with your dissertation, speaking about uh, Deuteronomy and themes of righteousness and obedience, uh, with this latest book, there seems to be, you know, as you mentioned, maybe a 15-year case that's kind of been unfolding. Curious, just your thoughts on that, how, how intentional that has been, or has it been more of an organic just process as you're moving from project to project? This seems to be a theme, the righteousness and the obedience of Christ, a theme that has been unfolding for you. Yeah, I think it's probably a combination. I I, I did a dissertation, uh, as you mentioned, on Deuteronomy and Matthew. And the mm -hmm. question that I went into that with is, how do you read the Gospels? Uh, what is going on? What's the background for what Jesus is doing in the Gospels? Not just what he teaches, but what he's doing. And, um, and so I, I came at that with a pretty traditional way in a dissertation, looking at Old Testament background, Jewish literature, and so forth uh, for a New Testament uh, project. And as I was working on that, uh, the question that really was driving that dissertation or thesis type of project was still simmering in the back of my mind. And that is, is what is Jesus doing in the Gospels as our mm -hmm. Savior? That's sort of the question that was still simmering. And that led me to the book, which eventually came to be titled The Last Adam, where I came at that from an Adamic lens and looked at Christ as the representative human and his obedience as uh, as uh, defending uh, well, not defending, but saving us from uh, from sin and defeating the devil and so forth. And from that point, I had a couple of other things that were uh, related that that I saw that I wanted to study further. So I wrote an article, for example, on an early Christian writing called the Epistle to Diognetus, where it looked mm. at something called the sweet exchange. Uh, the righteousness of the one covering the right, the unrighteousness of the many. So I looked at what that meant in its context. Um, and that wasn't a book per se, but it comes to be part of the background for this latest book we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Matthew Barrett put together a volume uh, on justification, and I was working on the article in that book on uh, Paul's letters outside of Romans. And we started talking, and, and he had an article on the obedience of Christ. And so I said, hey, uh, I, I've done a little bit on this, and we talked about it, so I ended up doing that article as well. Uh, I did a little bit of that in the eighth chapter of The Last Adam. And then the book on Acts is sort of related, but a little different. It's on the resurrection in Acts, but if you know the theology of the resurrection, it is predicated in many ways on the obedience of Christ as, as perfect Adam. Uh, it, you have his divine nature as well that, that you have to take account for. And so it just sort of organically grew. In this book that we're discussing today... Uh, my original thought was, hey, maybe I could take four or five, six of these articles that I've done in various contexts, journals and, um, and books and so forth, and just sort of bring them together. Mm 
And mm. so I, I talked to the folks at Baker, uh, Brian Dyer there, we talked about that, and um, and he liked the idea, but said, let's make this a book. So we went from reprinting essays, which is not always the most exciting way to write a book, <laughs> and then we turned it into a new book. And so what I did was I took all of that and tried to dis distill it down, and I really rewrote this from a blank page uh, yeah. using some of the work I'd already done. So in that way, it was sort of just organic. It just kind of happened. Uh, but it certainly does reflect some of the questions I've been thinking through the past 10, 15 years. Sure. No, I appreciate that. For those who are watching the video, here's a picture of the book. Why Did Jesus Live a Perfect Life? It is, as Brandon uh, alluded to, published by Baker Academic, as uh, many of the other uh, previous books he's, he's published have been. We always appreciate Baker. They do fine work, great editorial team over there, but also the product is always – I never get a, a, a just a bad book from Baker. It's, it's always clean. The typesetting's great. The quality's great. They just do, they just do excellent work. I'm thankful for that. Yeah, I've had a great experience with Baker. They, they're very professional. They, they're very talented, very skilled editors. And, um, and mm -hmm. I like the, uh, the, 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 their mix of types of books that they do. They do a lot of these biblical, theological types of books that uh, really finds a, a nice um, venue for some of these ideas to publish. So I'm thankful that they uh, that they've given me some opportunities to to write. Yeah, I'm curious what you think about that. You you write early on in the book about biblical theology and maybe introduce some folks who might not be entirely familiar with that discipline uh, to it. But in this 15 year span of working on these thoughts, have you have you recognized or realized a shift in scholarship or the acceptability of these types of approaches? Is it as unusual to find? biblical theology as it used to be? Yeah, so a, a part of it depends on what you mean by biblical theology. Right. <laughs> uh, but if, if you mean in our tradition, the combination of sort of an right. organic outworking of you know, Bible, theological topics, but really the, the, the progress of redemptive history in a Vossian type yes. of approach, uh, that is not all that common. I mean, you have right. you know, Greg Beale writing massive books on this. Uh, you've got some of those, um, you know, Ben Glass done good work on some of these mm -hmm. things in New Testament. I'm just pulling out a couple of names that come to mind. Yeah. Uh, there are others as well. But it's in some ways a reformed approach if you want to understand the unity of the Old and New Testaments. Now, I do think there is a, a proliferation of those who are asking theological questions. Uh, and I like uh, that conversation that's going on. It gives an opportunity for uh, a reformed approach to be brought into discussion. Mm -hmm. So I do think there is a, a, a greater proliferation now than there was when I started my dissertation on things like uh, reading the Gospels theologically, um, the theological interpretation of Scripture movement, whatever that is. Uh, that was sort of just coming into its own around 2005, 6, 7, it seems. Sure. And uh, that's still around, and I think you, you've seen that going a few different directions. Um but it's my my own take on that is there's a lot that good that has been um, produced on that, and mm -hmm. there are other things that have been produced that I just don't find as persuasive, and I still think there is a a need for uh, some people at least to just bring in biblical studies to conversation with uh, the wider exegetical tradition, what we call historical or systematic theology, and. I think some people do that. I think others uh, in the biblical studies world, that's not their forte. And um, so one thing I do try to do in this book, it's something that I do maybe know a little more about being at a theological seminary. I do that a little more maybe than some others. And so I, I'm trying um, consciously to bring that those two areas, you might say the historical systematic, into conversation right. with uh, the biblical studies world. So that's a long answer to your question. Yes, I think more people oh. are doing it. But I still think that, that we need people out there who are doing it. Well, I think it's important, um, of course, at Westminster, even at the founding, or at least one year after the founding, it's very uh, innovative, so to speak, with the work of John Murray, and then following after him, especially Dr. Gaffin, for many years, uh, blending uh, biblical studies and systematic theology. People who are familiar with that tradition might not realize how unusual that is. Uh, in the wider scope. And at least a few decades ago, it was still common. I'm not a, you know, I study the Bible, but I'm not a, a biblical studies person, so to speak, in terms of my specific academic training beyond the MDiv. Obviously, I had a full range of, of biblical studies courses in the MDiv, but several decades ago, it was really uh, preferred, or at least uh, they try to keep things quarantined. You should be doing biblical studies, study the Bible, don't bring in your theological ideas. 
don't interpret it according to your tradition or even according to history. Like there's, there was this sense, uh, and, and a lot of this would just be unbelieving biblical studies too, which might be surprising to people that such a thing exists. People do study the Bible as just a historic document, uh, independent of, <laughs> of the church or anything, which for me, I don't know why I would devote my life to that, but <laughs> some people do. But there's this kind of presupposition or uh, this idea that you can treat it in a purely sanitary, um, scientific way as an object independent of this whole, you know, superstructure or infrastructure of the church and uh, the way it's been received. So I'm very glad that that uh, seems as if at least conservative scholarship is starting to eradicate those kinds of ideas. But um, that's not to say we don't need biblical studies and a rigorous approach in terms of its specific discipline and that it's, it's certainly needed. And it's certainly helpful to realize how that is different from biblical theology, from systematic theology, and how systematics is even different as a specific discipline from historical theology. But yet they're all related. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting too much. You know, we're talking inside baseball, but people like that, too. Well, it, it really is an observation I think is accurate. That is, uh, biblical studies is, believing biblical studies is starting to see that uh, a neutral approach or a historical critical approach doesn't yeah. really line up with the text. And and I think the longer I, I, I'm around biblical studies, I'm starting to see that more and more. Uh, that's not to say that you can't learn uh, many good things from right. all, all sorts of um, people from all sorts of backgrounds. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day... Uh, is Jesus a man from Nazareth or is he the divine son of God who came down? Mm -hmm. and, and so, Absolutely. for example, the historical Jesus movement, it's, it's very difficult to square that uh, with the creedal traditions uh, that uh, I believe in God, the father almighty and Jesus Christ is only uh, begotten son and so eternal son of God who comes down. Mm -hmm. And so the starting point is quite different. Uh, same thing with confessing the scriptures as the word of God. It's, uh, it is important that we do that. And um, uh, you, you can, get off on the wrong foot uh, if you're not careful and and start imbibing some of the assumptions of unbelieving scholarship even if that's not your own persuasion and, mm. and before you know it you're actually doing a method uh, that doesn't quite cohere uh, as well as it should with what you confess so it, it's something yeah. we all have to watch out for I think. sure well one of your main theses if not the main point of this book is that perfect obedience is necessary for salvation and that might seem like an obvious point, but but it, it's not. <laughs> it's not <laughs> for a lot of for a lot of people in the Christian tradition. It, you know, maybe they'll say it, but it, it isn't worked out consistently. So, um, you know what what do you mean there by that basic statement? And let's set the table here for the the chapters to come in terms of perfect obedience. Uh, can you flush that out for us a bit? It's probably helpful to start with Adam, and when we get there, mm -hmm. and. The way the Westminster Confession puts it, Adam was required to personal, perfect, entire, and perpetual obedience. And this course correlates to the covenant of life or the covenant of works with Adam, where he was a creature who was not autonomous before God, but and God gave him uh, this benefit through the covenant. That is, if you obey, you will receive permanent, right. glorious, eschatological life. Mm -hmm. And Adam failed. We know the story there. And then the way the New Testament comes in and relates Christ's work to Adam and undoing the effects of Adam. Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15, maybe Hebrews yes. 2, some of these texts. Uh, you see that uh, what was required of Adam uh, was he failed. And his one trespass brought condemnation for all people. So all in Adam die. And this is Romans 5. And then Christ's act of righteousness the righteous act of one man, uh, through that comes life for all who are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the, there are parallels, there are differences as well between Adam and Christ, but you've got the, the what was offered to Adam was eternal eschatological life if he met the condition of the covenant, which was perfect obedience. He failed in that, but in the covenant of grace, Christ comes, he takes that a requirement upon himself freely by taking a human nature for us and for our salvation and he obeys perfectly and therefore uh, he grants us eternal life and this is maybe part of where you're going here our eternal life 
is built on the foundation of Christ's perfect obedience, and that we can say as well is the foundation of our justification. Not what we do, but what Christ has done, yeah, meeting yeah. those requirements, and that is our foundation. And it's interesting, well, not interesting, maybe sad, that a lot of people may acknowledge that obedience is necessary, and so Christ's obedience is necessary, but often will mix it with something else. Or they'll, maybe it's not perfect, or they'll say, we can, God will receive our imperfect good works uh, as credit towards salvation or a grade on a curve, all these sorts of things. But obviously from a reform perspective, uh, we're speaking uh, about covenant theology. That's a great requirement. When we look at the Bible and how Paul speaks and not him alone, but how the message comes through in Genesis one and two and throughout scripture is, is we have a covenant of works. I don't know about you. Uh, I should know this. I should remember this. But I I grew up in a covenantal church ish. I grew up in the mainline Presbyterian church, so it had covenantal kind of undertones. But I wasn't catechized. <laughs> but eventually, in, in uh, when I went off to college, I ended up in a Calvinistic Baptist church. I don't say Reformed Baptist church because they weren't uh, confessional according to the 1689 London Baptist Confession or anything. But they just flat out would reject the idea that there was a covenant of works. And I'd point out Romans 5, 12 through 21 and say, well, how do you make sense of this? And there just, you know, wasn't an answer. But I don't see how we can make sense of the gospel as you do throughout the book without, without that understanding of the covenant of works. If we don't understand the covenant of works correctly, it's hard to understand anything else about what Jesus actually did. But more than that, even the presupposition before that is that Adam was actually a person who did something. <laughs> That's another point that yeah. you that you make in the book, and and it's one rejected by many people, even post conservative uh, evangelicals who are starting to entertain the idea that Adam is some sort of construct or literary construct, it wasn't necessarily an historical figure, but that these stories were written in order to provide us some sort of whatever, theological or, or uh, narratival construct so that we can make sense of what's to come. It doesn't really matter mm -hmm. if he was real or not. What really matters is the lesson that's being taught. So I, I appreciate yeah, it, you hammering it's, it's on both of those points here. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, if you believe that Scripture is clear and that Scripture is truthful, it's not as though we have one debated passage about Adam, you know, where, there, okay, there's this <laughs> right. awkward phrase where Adam means man, and maybe it means a person. Or uh, a place, like Adam, in Hosea. <laughs> or Hosea, right, Hosea 6, 7. And so right. you've got, uh, uh, Hosea 6, 7, by the way, probably does mention a covenant with Adam. It's either oh, at I Adam think or so. with Adam. And, I'm convinced. And if it says at Adam, no one really knows what happened there, but it's with Adam. <laughs> Um, well, you've got Adam in the genealogy in First Chronicles, Adam in the genealogy of Luke 3, Adam in sort of in a genealogy in Jude. Uh, Enoch was the seventh from Adam. You've got uh, Adam in Genesis 1 to 3, his children in Genesis 5. Uh, you've got uh, mentions of Adam. No, I haven't mentioned Paul yet. Romans, 15, uh, Romans, Romans 5, 1 yeah, Corinthians 15, 15. Mm -hmm. uh, 1 Timothy 2. So you've got ample, ample places in Scripture where Adam is a person, and what he did is discussed. And so uh, you, one would have to really, uh, I don't want to oversimplify things, but reject all of those passages as being clear and, and stating what they seem to say, or have some sort of hermeneutical uh, device whereby you say the New Testament didn't understand the Old Testament or something, but that just compounds the problem. And so... Adam is a real person, and yes, it can get complicated, but in the Bible, it's not uh, its not just an illustration or something. It's, it explains how death is a reality for all people, and the good news is it explains how all people, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from, where they're born, what they look like, all people have the chance to be in Christ, uh, turn to Christ and have life, and that is uh, because of the unity and the solidarity of the human race. Mm -hmm. and so there, there are really important theological points that cannot be... Uh, cannot be overlooked there when you think about if someone denied Adam was a real person, you, you've got some real problems on your hands to discuss the unity of salvation in Christ. Absolutely. I'd love to ask you about uh, the Mosaic Law. That's the fourth chapter uh, of your book, the Mosaic Law and Perfect Obedience. But while we're on the subject of Romans 5, and you know we back up in, in terms of the, the case Paul is making throughout Romans, 
I'd like to ask you uh, maybe a transitional question, because Paul there speaks about how death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin in the likeness uh, of Adam. And, the, you know, that's a perplexing statement for a lot of folks. I'll, I'll, I'll provide my, my understanding. I'm not saying this is an authoritative interpretation, but I'd be curious to hear how you take this. The question for me is, there seems to be uh, some sort of arrangement at Sinai that is introduced that enables people to sin again in the likeness of Adam. But even from between the covenant of works and Mount Sinai, where the uh, the Mosaic uh, covenant is established, people are still dying. So just the basic point here is, what do we do about the fact that people die between Adam and Moses, right? And how... How do we fit that into our theology? I think the, the clear lesson that Paul's teaching, regardless of the nuances of how we understand Moses, but they're dying because of the punishment of Adam that is, that is wrought to all mankind on account of Adam's sin. So there has to be some connection between the, what the one person Adam did and, what, and everyone who descends from him. We understand that in the Reformed tradition quite simply. It's just that that's the covenant of works. It's the, it's, it's the imputation of Adam's sin to all of his descendants. And then we end up again with another um, covenant being established, a co- an administration of the covenant of grace in, uh, in Exodus. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. What are your thoughts on death reigning from Adam to Moses? How does that even further the case that there needs to be something, something else to save us out of this? Yeah, it, that's a complicated passage. I, sure. I think what you're saying is very, very plausible, right? So a <laughs> uh, plausible way forward. I, I think what your your point here is this, and this is the point that I think is uh, most relevant, is um, I'm, I'm pr- let me preview just a little bit. A lot of mm-hmm. folks say that in the Bible, in the New Testament, law means law of Moses, period. Mm. Uh, but there are indications that law cannot simply mean law of Moses. There are other places where law seems to mean something else. Sure. And so um, Pauline scholars, for example, will say law almost always means this. And Galatians 3 is a place uh, where this comes up as well. But what you see there in Romans 5, uh, it seems to be that you've got a law that's in place before the law of Moses is given. Mm-hmm. And this is not the first time there's a law there. And so if there's a punishment, they must have been breaking some kind of a law. And mm-hmm. it's not just the Mosaic law that brings death, in other words. Death is something that's already there. So you can't right. say it just starts with the Mosaic law. Uh, that's a very quick uh, overview. But what we have is a specialty of what Ad- a special type of sin Adam has, has committed. And that the likeness of the sin of Adam is a little different, but a lot different. But you have in the death that reigns from Adam to Moses, you have the implications of Adam's sin even before yes. the law of Moses comes. So maybe that's similar to what you're saying. Uh, and it yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it sets us up to understand that in, uh, when you come to the law of Moses, this is not the, uh, the genesis of the law. Uh, there, Correct. There, the law has already been there in some respect. And I think, uh, to anticipate perhaps a question, I think Leviticus 18.5. Mm-hmm. Uh, he who does these things will live by them is this principle in the Mosaic law that that reminds us of the bigger principle of eternal life is wedded to perfect obedience. Now, what mm-hmm. I've just said is not common parlance in New Testament scholarship, nor is the word parlance. I just made that, that's the word that just came to mind. <laughs> no one uses that term. But uh, most people don't talk that way. But that's the language of much of the Reformed tradition. And I find it to be the most compelling. So we may come there, we may not. But. Yeah, just to wrap that up on and death reigning from Adam to Moses, all I'm trying to say at the moment is people died between Genesis 2 or 3. Genesis 3, when you know the fall into sin occurred, all the way up into Exodus, so hundreds of years, people are dying. Why are they dying? Death is the wages of sin, right? But they're not only dying based on their own personal sin. You know, you could think of... We could think of infants dying in infancy in that stretch. Well, why are they dying? They're dying because Adam sinned and uh, he transgressed the covenant and therefore death spread to all men. And that's what exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans 5, just, you know, several verses later. 
then the question is to get back then to Moses here on your in chapter four, and not to turn this into a, a you know question just about this particular passage in Romans, but something new is introduced in Romans or in uh, in Exodus with Moses. That's a, a highly debated point of Reformed systematic theology. Many nuances, many different views in terms of how we categorize the Mosaic economy and that we're in the Mosaic covenant. But one thing we should all agree on if we are confessing the Westminster Standards, for example, is that Moses is indeed an administration of the covenant of grace. But that provides another complicated layer here I'd like for you to address. You address it in the book, of course, um, and, uh, and I think you address it really well there. But how are we to understand then what the, what the New Testament says about the law of Moses? Did it require perfect obedience? And if so... How do we understand the fact that this was given to a redeemed people, a people who were right. already under grace? How do we? How, do, how, how would you suggest we start to approach some of those complicated questions? Yeah, I think I have the quote from Ritterboss in the book that the way you understand the law of Moses and Paul is an exceedingly complex problem, uh, and I, I think that's that's a good way to put it. Um, so there's a number of, of debated aspects, and here's where the rubber sometimes meets the road, where the rub is, is for those who say that perfect obedience is not necessary. Right. One of the reasons they say that is they say the law of Moses never required perfect obedience. It had a sacrificial system built into it. It assumed they were going to sin. And so the, the law of Moses, you might hear this language if you read enough New Testament scholarship, the law of Moses was not a ladder of good works that people could work their way up based on their merit. And so the reformers and so forth who talked about merit, they misunderstood the law of Moses. And uh, perfect obedience is not necessary. What's necessary for justification is our faithfulness to Christ, something like that. Um, and so you get one of the unfortunate byproducts of that is downplaying what Christ has done for us. Mm -hmm. Now, um, is the law of Moses an administration of the covenant of grace if it says he who does these things will live by them? Exactly. And the answer is yes, it is an administration of the covenant of grace because there right. is a sacrificial system built in. You have the Day of Atonement, right? You have uh, you have the Lord appearing to uh, Moses, um, God slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and so forth. So as the Confession, chapter 19, and you can find it elsewhere, puts it, there, this is a part of the administration of the covenant of grace. But... Within that administration of the covenant of grace, you have, however you want to put the pieces together, and my mm -hmm. point is not to get into the debates at this point. There is, I would say, this way, there's a principle there that says, he who does these things will live by them. And so right. it reminds us of the obligation to perfect obedience uh, and reminds the people that if they think this law is by faith, uh, sorry, by works, as though they were working their way to God, Paul gets on to his countrymen this way in Romans 9, then you're going to miss the point because the law does require faith. But if you take the principle, Leviticus 18.5, and make that your daily ritual, your daily uh, understanding for how to walk with sure. God, then you're required to do all of these things. And this comes to a head in Galatians 3.10-14. to 14. And a lot of debate about this passage. Uh, all who are of the law are under a curse. Mm -hmm. That's what the Greek says. And translations typically go, all tra most translations typically say something like all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. The word rely is not there. It's a matter of how you take ex ergon namu, uh, ex ergon namu, the, by works of the law. And I, at the end of the day, I think those traditional translations are correct. Uh, so on the one hand, if you think anyone characterized by works of the law refers to the Jewish people only who experienced exile, then you're not going to see the same sort of critique against anyone who relies on works of the law in the way the traditional Reformed um, Protestant understanding of this text says, which is anyone who relies on the work of the law could be Jew or Gentile. And if you're trying to rely on works of the law, you're going to be under a curse because he then quotes not only Leviticus 18.5 in that passage, but also Deuteronomy 27.26. Curses is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the law to do them. And so you see these slight emphases in the way Paul uses the Old Testament in contrasting Habakkuk 2.4 with, Le uh, with uh, Leviticus 18.5 and then combining Leviticus 18.5 with Deuteronomy 
to emphasize uh, he who does these things will live by them and you must do all of them. So if you're telling someone they have to be circumcised to be a Christian, you just introduce a works principle that requires that person to be uh, perfectly abide by the works principle. Instead, the other option is the path of faith. And this is the path of Abraham, going back to verse 9 and previous, chapter 3. Abraham is a man who was justified before God by faith. And so you have the contrast between faith and works, just like you have in Romans. So yes, the principle is there in the Mosaic, Mosaic economy. He who does these things will live by them. But so is the promise, these things are not too hard for you, and they are near you in your heart. This is Deuteronomy 30. Paul quotes this in yeah. Romans 10. And so if you approach God on the basis of faith, then justification was there for you in the Old Testament, just like it is in the New Testament. So, yeah, uh, and that's 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 a short answer to that uh, complicated, complicated discussion. And certainly we'll be swimming upstream from some New Testament scholarship in that chapter. But uh, so the answer is, yes, I do think the Mosaic law is part of the covenant of grace. And at the same Mm -hmm. time, it does attest the principle that perfect obedience is required for for eternal life, not for us on a day to day basis. But Christ sure. meets that requirement for us. And there's a lot for folks who'd like to follow up. There's a lot more to be said. And we've had other episodes dealing with some of these issues, even regarding the hypothetical use of the use of the law. Hypothetically speaking, if someone were able or if someone actually obeyed the law perfectly, would they be saved? Some people, even within the form, reform tradition, say yes. Other people, including myself, um, uh, would say no, because that wasn't the point of the law to begin with. But that's a debated point. Um, all of this is is uh, fascinating and important to discuss. But I think the thing I'd like to at least tie up here on this is that it all depends on, on your relation to it. And this is how we can make sense of different passages, which talk about the law is, you know, is brings death. But then how many of the Psalms talk about, I love your word, O oh Lord, I love your law. So how how can this same thing? It's not as if the law is changing or if it's re, you know, morphing in, into different forms for different people. The law of the Lord is good and wise, but it also kill you. So it depends ultimately upon our relation to it. Do we approach God's law as a way for us to prove ourselves or to earn our salvation, or do we approach the law, you know, in, in terms of resting in Christ and seeking to live a godly life and seeking to please the Lord. And if we love the Lord, we will obey his commandments. Uh, How many times is that said by John and others? So it doesn't have to get more simple than that, although this is a highly complex subject. But the question does come back to faith and faith in what, or, or more precisely, faith in whom and why. And that's why our faith needs to be in Christ, the perfect, obedient son, because he has accomplished all these things for us, dying the death that we deserve uh, and also being raised for our salvation. That's basically the book of Romans too. So Romans as well, I should say. But beyond Romans, I'd love for you to talk about... Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Ken. Well, if if, if it's on Romans, I was just going to ask you about Jesus' obedience in the Gospels. But uh, please pick up on Romans if you'd like. Uh, But I'd I'd love to talk more about Jesus in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, you you were mentioning the nature of faith, and I do address this a little bit in the book, and that is uh, faith in Christ on the one hand. Yes, that's important. And I think those passages where you have pistis or pistios Jesu Christu, faith in Christ or faith of Jesus Christ, I'm all for emphasizing the faithfulness of Christ, but I don't think those Greek phrases where you have a genitive that says of Jesus Christ is is what they call a subjective genitive, which is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And one reason is because you have ample passages that don't have that construction, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. Like in yes. Acts, it's ace, faith in Christ, and so forth. Yeah. Um, the other thing is... Well, I should say, so people know, you're following up on various exegetical tactics or strategies that are that are more common in the new perspective on Paul or sometimes in the federal vision, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and sometimes right. in certain places, as you're saying, and that is an appropriate interpretation. It's conceivable grammatically. But when you take the scripture as a whole, that's not necessarily the best way to translate those. Yeah, that, that's my take sections. on it. And even Reformed folks might might have different opinions on that. But I think right? faith of Jesus Christ is an objective oh. genitive, faith in Christ, yeah. because there are clear passages that where you can tell that's what they mean. And like in sure. the book of Acts, which I think needs to be part of the conversation. And the other thing that's related to this, you were talking about faith, is it's easy to misconstrue faith as a work that we do. And it's not. 
Uh, faith is an instrument. And so I've heard it said, and maybe you heard it said, or your hearers, or listeners have heard it said, uh, faith is the one work we can do. Uh, well, not really. Uh, if you look at John 6, he says, oh, man. what is the work of God that we should do? And he, Jesus says, this is the work of God. You believe in the one whom he has sent. And it's ironic there. It's not a work at all. You know, so we're asking, what can we do? And Jesus basically says nothing. You believe yeah. in something else. And so it's it's directed external. So uh, we, if you want to come back to that, we can. But uh, work is not the right category for us to understand right. faith. Instrument, I think, captures it really well. That's, in the way that's most precise. But, yeah, even just uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it's a gift. Even even our yep. faith, all of salvation is a gift, but faith itself, uh, and that just flows and John forth six from might the, say the same thing. So some think yeah. that, that that text is actually saying this is the the work that God does in you is faith, and so it's possible there. But uh, yeah. certainly in Ephesians two, you see it. Yeah. Well, you've done a well, you'll see the gospel. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> you've done quite a bit of work there. Uh, you've done a lot of work in a lot of things in in the course of your uh, academic. Um, work as well as as your work in the classroom you teach a, a wide variety of the new testament but specifically here how do we see jesus obedience and salvation in the gospels how how do the gospel writers present jesus obedience specifically it's helpful to see jesus as an anointed representative in the gospels he's the messiah the christ look at the baptism of Jesus, uh, look at his anointing throughout the Gospels with the Spirit, uh, casting out demons by the Spirit of God and so forth. So what you see with Christ is not a, a private individual, but a public person. And that's helpful to see. So when he fights uh, tempta the battle of temptation, he's fighting that on our behalf as a, as a new Adam. And it's interesting, a couple of ways you might see that. In the Gospel of Luke, you have Jesus being baptized. Then you have a genealogy. Now, that genealogy has 77 names, and it ends with Adam. And right after that, he is cast into the wilderness to be tempted, and he overcomes the temptation. And similarly, Mark's gospel, where the temptation is two verses. And Jesus was with the wild animals being tempted, and uh, the angels were ministering to him. It's uh, stark for how, how brief it is. But there you see Jesus is not giving us a pattern, primarily, especially in Mark, and how we ought to... Mm respond to temptation. Yeah. We may learn from this, especially in Matthew and Luke, but he's actually going to fight a battle against the strong man. And if you go to Mark 3, 22 to 30, he explains what he's been doing up to that point in the gospel. And he gives a parable about a stronger man. That's exactly what John the Baptist prophesied Jesus was going to be. He's the stronger man who binds the strong man, and that is the devil. And so what you begin to see is Jesus is binding the devil he is overcoming the devil, defeating him in close conjunction with his obedience. And so the obedience of Christ is part of what he is doing on our behalf, both as to do what we have not done, but also to uh, defeat all his and our enemies, you might say. And that yeah. is defeating the devil, delivering us from sin. Amen. Amen. I love that. Um, it's it's beautiful to see all the the confluence of themes. You've in many of your works have have treated different themes about Christ. Appreciate how you mentioned the messianic theme of how he's anointed, how he's our champion, uh, how he is the obedient one. Uh, he's also a suffering servant, of course, and that's not unrelated to his obedience. Uh, that brings up perhaps a point of you know whenever we're talking about the obedience of Christ uh, and you're treading into the waters of systematic theology, people may be familiar with the active and the passive obedience of Christ. How are we to understand those? And uh, you warn readers from falling into the trap of thinking them as just stages of his obedience. Why is that important? Yeah, I think a lot of people hear those terms, and if they're just mildly familiar with them, they might think active obedience is the life of Jesus, passive obedience is the death of Jesus on the cross. And what you may find is some people say, of course, Christ is passively obedient for us, but the act of obedience, that's a whole other story. But I think the best articulations of those understand that the, the work of Christ is this unified whole. And to talk about the active and passive obedience is simply to describe one thing. And you're describing the representative obedience of Christ for us. So on the one hand, the active obedience of Christ covers his life and his death. Uh, from you know conception to his to his death on the cross, 
And that refers to him positively loving God and neighbor, doing all that is required in the law of God. The passive obedience, it's not a good English translation, comes from the Latin <laughs> patior, to suffer. The suffering obedience of Christ is really what that mm -hmm. refers to. The suffering is concentrated on the cross, certainly, but his whole life is one of suffering. He's taking yes. on the penalty of cursing for us, not because he was a sinner, because he was not, but on our behalf, because we are sinners. And that covers not just the death on the cross, but his whole life as well. So every stage of his life, every activity of his life, you see both the active and passive obedience united, because we're just describing things from different angles, and we're describing that one unified obedience. Bob Inc. in Volume 3 is really helpful on this. Calvin, mm. Book 2 of the Institute, says uh, he liberates us through the whole course of his obedience. Uh, and so th there's a strong Reformed tradition here, and I think that's the best way to understand uh, the obedience of Christ. It's not two stages. There's no time you can cut it off and say, now we're in the mm -hmm. passive obedience. Because if you think about it, on the cross, Christ is actively, willingly, uh, volitionally obeying his Father, like in, in a m most concentrated, difficult time. And so you, you can't find a place where you can cut it off and say, now we're into passive obedience. It doesn't work. Sure. It's both and all the way. Through. Which also f makes it even all the more difficult for some people to try to parcel out aspects of Christ's obedience so that only uh, the the passive obedience is imputed, for example. Um, it, it When we really start to think about the obedience of Christ as a whole, uh, such such positions are even more untenable. It is one I don't thing, know you how, can't yeah. separate it. Right. Yeah, you can't Absolutely. separate it. And um, uh, there are some... I forget where the quote comes from, but I, I've seen a couple of these quotes at least once, I guess, which it says, we have no interest in dividing the work of Christ in any way. <laughs> Why would we divide it? It's a unified way. It's not up to us to say, here we go, let's, let's cut it right here. That's not what yeah. we do. Uh, we, we look at what Christ has done, and we take the whole thing. And, and by the way, yeah. in not an abstraction from the person of Christ, but of we course. have Christ and his work on our behalf, so that the in Amen. Christ certainly is important as well. Yeah. Um, speaking of the work of Christ, though, and zooming in more specifically on, on what many people would categorize under his passive obedience, we're thinking about his work as a perfect high priest. Of course, there are many active aspects there, too, so I don't, I don't want to complicate matters too much. But uh, you bring up the book of Hebrews and then uh, also the Old Testament background of Psalm 40. Uh, on how Jesus is serving as an effective and a final high priest by doing everything that God commands and thus overcoming the dichotomy between sacrifice and obedience that was a problem for God's people. Can you explain that dichotomy and explain how Christ brings to resolution and completion this, this finished work? Yeah, one of the problems you see Jesus critiquing is hypocrisy. And mm -hmm. that hypocrisy is something that the prophets are also critiquing. They're critiquing God's people for doing the right things on the outside, but inside their hearts are far from God. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy for them to go to the temple to make the sacrifices, and yet they're not really trusting God. And the Jeremiah, for opening chapters of Jeremiah, for example, a Saul in 1 Samuel 15, to obey is better than sacrifice. Hosea 6, I desire mercy, not a sacrifice. That is in comparison to uh, ob true obedience, a sacrifice means nothing, those sorts of things. So you, you have this precedent in the Old Testament, but one of the problems that you find is that even among the priests, they're sinners. And no priest can bring that final deliverance because they're having to offer sacrifices for sins for the people, but also for themselves. <laughs> and you find that they are only serving in a copy of the heavenly reality. This is Hebrews. You can yeah. hear the echoes of Hebrews in what I'm saying. And so Christ is the final priest who does not need to offer a qualitatively inferior blood of an ox or a, a goat. He offers his own blood. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices for himself because he is perfectly sinless. He has done everything God requires, both internally and externally. And he doesn't serve in simply a copy, a, a, a leather tabernacle on earth. He serves in the inner sanctum of heaven. And so what you have in Hebrews is the, the assumption that is driving through this teaching on propitiation in Hebrews 2, for example, is that Christ is the perfectly obedient priest uh, who offers the perfect sacrifice. And yeah, um, this is a debate, but he offers a sacrifice on earth. He ascends to heaven and as a resurrected priest. And now he continues his priestly ministry 
from the right hand of God. And so mm-hmm. what you have then is overcoming this dichotomy of obedience and, and sacrifice and that uh, he fully fulfills Psalm 40, where David already had the law of God on his heart, but uh, he did not bring that final deliverance. David was a sinner. He had problems. He died and so forth. But Jesus is the final perfect priest. Uh, he perfectly coheres to the will of God. You see that throughout his life. And the redemption that he has accomplished is final and better because he is final and better, you might say. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, at the end of that life, when he offered his life uh, as a sacrifice for the many to pay the penalty for our sins, he was, uh, re- after remaining in the grave for three days, he was raised from the dead. And uh, he was raised for our justification, among many other things. He was also raised for our whole salvation, of course. There's a logic to the resurrection, though, that a lot of people might not understand, or at least might not might not be aware of, regarding how his resurrection connects to his perfect obedience. Uh, what would you say there for that connection? How would what do you think is important that we would recognize when we're thinking about Jesus rising from the dead? Yeah, here I build on the work of Voss, Gaffin, others who who have really made a strong case here. And that is the resurrection is the vindication of Christ's mm-hmm. perfect obedience. First Timothy 3.16 calls it the justification or the vindication, however you translate that, of mm-hmm. Christ as our, as our mediator. And so what you have then is in the resurrection, it's the demonstration that Jesus was right, that death had no claim on him, that his message was true, that he is holy, he is righteous, and where there is no sin, there is no sting of death, as it were. So Christ overcomes death and his resurrection. You see this in 1 Corinthians 15, might be one of the best places to look here. Um, Hebrews 2, you could also get some of this from there, where Christ is overcoming death because he is pure, he is spotless. There is no claim of death on him, no claim of sin on him, so death cannot hold him. Now, you Mm -hmm. also have to relate that as well, and our tradition historically does this, not just to Christ as a man, but Christ as Son of God. Uh, And so the power of the divinity also is part of this resurrection teaching. But as we're thinking about the obedience of Christ, uh, one of the things it emphasizes is the perfection of his obedience. So Christ in his resurrected state is the resurrected one from the estate of humiliation, now in the state of exaltation. What he has done uh, is is vindicated, and and you can even say justified in his resurrection. Uh, Death has no claim on him. So those who are in Christ... Uh, death has no claim on us because we belong to Christ. And so mm. there, that is just part of our teaching and justification, uh, that we are delivered from sin uh, and uh, made right before God. Absolutely, yeah. It was not possible for him to remain in the grave, right? I believe that's uh, Acts right. 2. Right. Psalm 16, Acts 2, yeah. Acts yeah. 13. Amen. And by and the way, us, uh, that, this is one of the things I get into in the book on Acts is how common – uh, the preaching of the resurrection was in mm-hmm. among the apostles in the book of Acts, uh, and that it's one of their main themes, that Jesus is not dead. He's living. He reigns now, so you right. should turn to him and have life. Amen. Yeah, we follow after the, the man of heaven, the spiritual man, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Right. That covenantal connection there is so clear and explicit there that uh, those who believe in Christ will be like him, will be raised up uh, imperishable. Uh, to to glorified bodies, it is not possible for Christ's people to uh, to remain in the grave either. That's such an encouraging teaching. Um, how would you? I guess I'm going to ask you a more personal question, but it, it's uh, along the lines of what we find in chapter ten. Would you have some concluding thoughts here on what is required is finished? And you include some uh, some nice uh, quotations from our confessional tradition, including the Heidelberg Catechism. What are some of your hopes just for for people? This is a very accessible book. You you mentioned that you even try to minimize the footnotes and whatnot. I don't know why footnotes always scare people away, but they they do at, at times. But <laughs> um, what are your hopes for this book? What are what are your prayers? I suppose to the Lord and how He might use this with people um, in in churches. How might they come to know Jesus better and understand what He's done for them? Uh, what are some areas or aspects that you hope people would benefit from as they read this and think about these topics? Maybe two things come to mind. One is, if you're in a church, you're a college student, you're a high school student, and you're interested in this, you're 
uh, you know, you, you just go to church and, and you want to just get some of this rich theology, then I'm not saying what I've written is the rich theology, but I'm going to point you to mm. that rich theology from, from yeah. our tradition. Uh, and you're going to see some of the glories of what Christ has done. There may be things in there you've never understood or read before. And for those uh, who are coming to this for the first time, I think they're going to see some things here that I hope they see some things that help them understand how to read the whole Bible together and understand what Christ has done for us and understand what the gospel is. Uh, but I also hope it's it's um, a surprisingly simple answer for those who are struggling at the seminary level or at the college level or at the Ph.D. Mm -hmm. level. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are some of the questions that I remember being confronted with as a seminary student, as a Ph.D. student. Uh, what? How do we make sense of some of these complexities? I am trying to help wade through uh, what is, uh, we've already discussed it, even in the Reformed tradition, this can be complicated, but it gets even more complex whenever you are trying to find your way through just a morass of competing options from people coming from all sorts of angles when it comes to Paul and so forth. It can get really confusing. And I have found that asking the question that this book addresses, I think, is helpful. And the question is, is perfect obedience necessary for eternal life? If your answer is yes, then the new perspective on Paul will not be as compelling, right? Mm -hmm. If your answer is no, then it might be. But if your answer is yes, uh, why? Uh, where do we find that in Scripture? Uh, how can we defend that? Um, given the post-E.P. Sanders landscape from 1977 on, given where Pauline studies are, just to talk about Paul for a moment, what do we do? Uh, how can we go back in time and pretend like the new perspective never happened because now we know how complex Judaism was in the first couple uh, the centuries around the time of Christ. Uh, we we understand uh, the dangers and so forth, and so the dangers of anachronism and things like that. But so, can you go back and still hold on to this right. older reading? Is it exegetically defensible? And I think the answer is yes, it is. And I think it actually makes the best sense of the text of all mm -hmm. the texts as well. And so I'm trying to help readers who may be struggling, who may be, feel like maybe they, they heard justification language their whole life. They get to college, they get to seminary, and, and people are questioning these basic things. Justification is not about how you're made right with God. It's about uh, how Jew and Gentile uh, cohere in the covenant community. Maybe they're hearing things like covenant nomism. Maybe they're hearing things uh -huh. like faith is a work. It means faithfulness. So this is my attempt to, to take... The complexity is what's going on, and just simplify it as much as possible to say if if you if you read this book, I think it will help bring clarity, regardless of where you come out. And maybe you don't agree with me, right. but if you if you do agree, then I hope it will help, and maybe it will persuade people along the way as well. Yeah, I think so. I appreciate that. Well done on this. I mean, if you have the question, the listener has the question: How does Christ's obedience relate to our salvation, to your salvation? That's the question of this book, and uh, it it it's very useful on that front. And uh, I appreciate um, your clarity, uh, but uh, not for, um, not at the expense of being thorough. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a great treatment here. And one of several in this, in this saga, this crow saga here of, <laughs> of books on, on Christ's obedience and his righteousness. What better, what, what, what else could, could be better to, to think about and write about? I mean, what you've chosen the yeah. good path, brother. So the book here, Why Did Jesus Live a Perfect Life? The Necessity of Christ's Obedience for Our Salvation by our guest today, Brandon Crow, published by Baker Academic. It's always a pleasure, Brandon. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks for the chance to join you and talk a little bit about it, Candid. My pleasure. You bet. We've got some other titles. I think I have another one of your books uh, on, on the shelf here. It's in a box somewhere. It might be on a shelf, but as we're unpacking, I think uh, I owe you another conversation uh on a on another title here and uh looking forward to everything else you got lined up do you have any other projects up your sleeve that, or anything you can talk about or at least uh give us a little bit of a foretaste i guess uh, i could say it's a big secret and, and raise interest level but it's not a secret so i'm happy to talk about it um <laughs> uh, only for your listeners will i let them know that um the biggest thing is a, a book on the person and work of christ uh, that is mm -hmm. in the editorial phases right now with oh Lex wow Press. It's yep. a new series of, of low systematic theology, biblical theology books. So Doctrine mm -hmm. of Revelation, Doctrine of Eschatology, Doctrine of God, all these things will be covered. This will be the first one, is my understanding. And it's written 
Uh, we're editing it, uh, and I don't know, maybe next time, sometime early 20, wow. middle 2023, I'm not sure. So it was quite an undertaking and, and with fear and trembling, but it's, it was a wonderfully enlightening and, and a process. So it covers person of Christ, work of Christ, Old Testament, mm-hmm. New Testament, church history, systematic theology, pastoral application. So wow. it's quite a mouthful. Very uh, so comprehensive. I, I'm hoping the series will be a helpful series though, uh, overall. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing that I'm working on, uh, uh, turning the page now to biblical studies as a commentary on James, and that's also with Lexham Press, and that will be due a couple of years away from now. So Interesting. On that. I remember your lectures on yeah. that when I took uh, your course in the MDiv. I appreciate that. I'm, I'd be, I'm looking forward to that one especially. I'd like to see how you interface with the Gospels there and wisdom literature. That's got to be some fun yeah, stuff you're exactly. working on. Wonderful. Trying to relate well, to Christ as well. Mm-hmm. You can find out yeah. uh, more information. You'll visit the links we'll post in the episode description to the book. Uh, you can find out information about uh, Brandon online as well. Post over to uh, Westminster Theological Seminary, wts.edu, as well as uh, you can find us online at reformedforum.org, where you will find information about all of our programs, our events, online video courses, everything we have available for free. Uh, now in 75 countries, I think. Last I checked, more than 3,500 students. So uh, check us out if you're interested in watching some videos. And uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. We're online. Email us at mail at reformedforum.org. I do want to thank everybody for listening and watching. And we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.